Welcome to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Alayinka from our studios here in London. Over the next half an hour, we'll be looking beyond the business headlines by giving you in-depth perspective on the stories that are affecting all of us. Coming up on today's show. New restrictions introduced by the British Prime Minister earlier this week fueled a £52 billion sell-off on the FTSE 100 in one single day. The pound two was on the back foot as the prospect of more pain caused by the pandemic added to deepening worries over fraught Brexit trade deals. I'll be speaking with senior research analyst Lukman Otunuga about the movements on the forex markets. And there could be further lockdown restrictions for the capital, as London Mayor Sadiq Khan has described the situation in the region as rapidly worsening. London mayoral candidate Nim Zobunge will be joining me to discuss how the tighter rules will impact communities already on the brink. Then later, a discussion with the CEO of DMA Global, Leon Isaacs, in France about the evolving digital payments ecosystem in Africa. But first, earlier this week, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced a range of new measures to combat the rapid rise in coronavirus cases in the UK. The announcement triggered a major sell-off on the FTSE All Share, as well as a weakening of the British pound. The restrictions could last for up to six months as the world awaits a vaccine. The new measures include office workers who can work from home should do so. Pubs, bars and restaurants in England will be ordered to close by 10pm each night. The planned return of spectators to sports venues will now not go ahead from October the 1st. Here's a snippet of the Prime Minister's televised address to the nation. So today I set out a package of tougher measures in England. Early closing for pubs, bars, table service only, closing businesses that are not COVID secure, expanding the use of face coverings, new fines for those that fail to comply, once again asking office workers to work from home if they can, while enforcing the rule of six indoors and outdoors. A tougher package of national measures combined with the potential for tougher local restrictions for areas already in lockdown. I know that this approach, robust but proportionate, already carries the support of all the main parties in Parliament. After discussion with colleagues in the devolved administrations, I believe this broad approach is shared across the whole UK. And to those who say, we don't need this stuff and we should leave people to take their own risks. I say these risks are not our own. The tragic reality of having COVID is that your mild cough can be someone else's death knell. I'm now being joined by our business correspondent, Simon Pusey, with a breakdown of the reactions following these new COVID restrictions. Simon, new restrictions, a new sense of anxiety felt across the whole country. Yeah, I think um, particularly when you look at jobs and business, um, I think a lot of people were hoping that obviously the lockdown restrictions are going to be easing and that we may be coming out of the crisis. But obviously we've seen what's happening in the rest of Europe, um, in, in France and in Italy, um, and things are picking back up obviously in Spain as well. So it's, it's inevitable really that this was going to come and, and happen here. Um, and I think it's particularly bad for the hospitality sector and the, um, and the night economy, especially with um, the Prime Minister saying um, that obviously there are going to be some measures that are going to have to be put in place. And these seem to revolve mainly around pubs and bars shutting at 10 p.m. A lot of people asking for the wisdom in that, you know, do you not get coronavirus, um, you know, at 9.45, but you do at 10 o'clock? Um, why are they doing this? I think the government would say um, that the reasons that they're trying to get people out of bars and pubs at 10 o'clock um, is mainly because young people seem to be spreading the, the virus more than older people, and young people obviously are more tend to congregate at those kind of times. Also, like social distancing, um, when you've had a few drinks, there's probably evidence to suggest that that sort of decreases. So there's probably some kind of... Um, Thought, thought behind that. But um, a lot of people saying this will be a crushing blow to the night economy, to pubs and bars that were already struggling. And the Labour Party, the leader of the opposition, say a second lockdown wasn't an inevitability. It could have been prevented had the government been a little bit more prepared. Let's um, hear what he had to say now. There should be nothing inevitable about a second lockdown. It would be a sign of government failure, not an act of God. It would take an immense toll on people's physical and mental health and on the economy. We need a national effort to prevent a national lockdown. The Prime Minister has had months to prepare for this, but instead of getting a grip, the government lost control. 
our testing system collapsed just when we needed it most. The British people want the government to succeed in fighting this virus. We all need the government to succeed. This is the time for leadership. So that's Keir Starmer there, obviously saying that, you know, this wasn't, didn't have to happen. It was because Boris and the government were underprepared, especially when it came to test and trace, which he said had been a bit of a shambles and wasn't, you know, as the government said, the government keeps saying that we're, we're testing more people than any other country in Europe. Um, but the, the opposition party is saying um, that's not the case and that it hasn't been good enough. And, and let's just get some response, really, um, for those measures that have been put in place um, that I was um, referring to earlier, referring to um, the 10 o'clock closing, Dame Carolyn. In Fairbairn, the Director General of the CBI, says the new measures would be a crushing blow for many businesses. Roger Barker, the Director of Policy at Employers Lobby Group, the Institute of Directors, said new restrictions would inevitably put brakes on economic recovery. We're obviously only starting to see a little bit of economic recovery in the last few weeks, but he says this will obviously turn, turn the tide on that. Thank you, Simon. Staying with Britain's new restrictions, on Monday, £52 billion was wiped off the value of the FTSE 100 over fears of a second wave of coronavirus. The pound too was on the back foot as the prospect of more pain caused by the pandemic added to the deepening worries over fraught Brexit trade deal talks. I'm now being joined by senior research analyst Lukman Otunuga. Lukman Otunuga, as always, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. My oh my, 2020 has been a rough year for Sterling, already under pressure last week due to no deal Brexit fears. What has the reaction been to these new restrictions here in Britain? Thank you for having me here today. Yes, the pound has been dragged through the concrete. It's weakened against every single G10 currency and it's tumbled to a two-month low against the dollar. It's currently down roughly 5% since the start of the quarter. I think the pound is struggling to nurse the deep wounds inflicted from the Brexit drama, shaky economic fundamentals, and now the threat of the UK entering a second round of lockdowns, which could cripple economic growth as haunted investor attraction towards the pound. I expect weakness to remain a key theme for the rest of September. September. Absolutely. Andrew Bailey, the Bank of England governor, was speaking earlier this week with the British Chamber of Commerce, hinted that negative interest rates may not be on the cards so soon. But clearly it must be a tool uh, that the Bank of England will use before the end of the year, no? Um, firstly, just looking at the pound's reaction, we can see that the pound has become quite sensitive to any comments regarding monetary or fiscal um, stance from the Bank of England. As things stand up right now, I don't believe that the central bank may adopt negative rates. Um, at worst, the central bank may decide to expand the quantitative easing program by 50 to 100 billion in November. And if things, get, if things get really messy, they may pull the rate cut trigger to zero interest rates. If we talk negative, that will probably be sometime in 2021 if COVID continues to negatively impact the UK economy. We're running out of time. Got to ask you, you are a senior research analyst, uh, but it is a tricky question. What is your outlook for the next couple of weeks going into October? Of course, you're expecting the uncertainty uh, for Sterling, but the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, he did say that these restrictions could get tougher. And unless there's no vaccine, we are likely to see a rise in COVID cases, aren't we? Certainly, the British Prime remains in a losing battle against COVID-19, um, terrible economic fundamentals and Brexit-related uncertainty. Now, the outlook is quite cloudy, especially when we're giving in mind how we've got the Brexit deadline on October the 15th. But to add to this, if the British pound continues to appreciate and save even demand, this could push the pound US dollar to levels not seen since April 2020, around a 1.220 handle. Goodness me. Well, look, man, Otunuga, Senior Research Analyst at FXTM. Thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. In London, Mayor Sadiq Khan is said to be extremely concerned by the latest evidence he had seen and was of the firm view that action should be taken before the virus spiralled out of control in the capital. Nimza Bunge is a 2021 London mayoral candidate and he joins me now to discuss the economic implications for ordinary Londoners if tougher lockdown measures are introduced. Nimza Bunge, thank you so much for joining me on the show. It's been a while. I know you've been pretty busy. You're likely to get busier, aren't you, if these new restrictions are going to last six months and they could get worse still. What has the reaction been from the Londoners that you've been speaking to? Well, Giniala, thank you so much for the privilege of being on your show. Um, I, I think that, without a doubt, we're living, as everybody has said, in unprecedented times. Um, I was speaking to a member of the local community just this morning, and he was saying that um, 
our concerns will always have to be about how this is going to impact the local economy. Um, our services here is based in Haringey. I, I run a charity, a church, and we have a community food hub and a food bank. Um, over the last year, um, we found the numbers ex increase exponentially. Um, and we, we serve at least 650 or more families every week. And um, that's through the activity of the food hub. We have about four different groups. We serve on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. And then we also have a Monday and Thursday delivery to homes. And we are, we're, we're concerned that the um, unemployment rate, the furlough rate, um, is really going to go up. Haringey actually is said to have the highest levels of unemployment and the second highest level of furlough in London. So we, we, we are concerned that our queues will get longer. We are concerned that the food that we're distributing um, may not be enough. We're asking the public and community to still keep supporting, but it's an unfortunate situation we find ourselves in. Uh, thank you, Nims. And can you expand on what you were just saying? Because it's it's so difficult, isn't it? Sometimes, you know, especially for our viewers, you may hear 6,000 jobs are gone there, 12,000 jobs here, this bar, this restaurant is closed. You can, you know, get distorted by all the facts, but these are real, ordinary people. Can you describe the type of people that are coming to some of your food banks? No, without a doubt. Um, it, it's challenging because... Um, I have engineers. There's a gentleman, an engineer, who is now without a job. He's a very decent gentleman, but finding it difficult. Never had to queue on a food line before. But what we try to do is give them a sense of dignity um, so that they can still walk through and pick enough food, hopefully, to support them in the course of the week. We've had um, folks who work in the education industry and um, bus drivers. Um, we've had folks who are students who, you know, are struggling. Um, folks who work in um, the hospitality industry, because the hospitality industry has been desperately impacted by this. Um, and I, I am actually supporting some very difficult young men who, who have, re some have resorted to alcohol um, to deal with depression and some of the battles that they're dealing with in their own personal lives. So it's, it's, it's really difficult. Um, I, I know that what we have to do is just continue to be there. Um, I would like to invite you, Julianne, as a matter of fact, to come to the project and um, have a conversation with some of these young men and women. Some of them are not so young, but all of them have a story to tell. And each story represents not one individual, but it represents uh, a host of other communities. Absolutely. Um, we did a survey. Absolutely. On the I'm, sorry, I'm, sorry to, I'm sorry to cut you there, Nims, but uh, I've got to tell you, yes, we will, uh, Channels Business Global will take you up on that offer. We certainly will come and yes. visit you um, with our crew at one of these food banks. Uh, we're running out of time, as we always do on this show, and I've got to bring the politics back into this. You are a politician. Yeah. Um, your uh, running mate, uh, Mayor Sadiq Khan, said the government hasn't got a grip on the true picture of COVID in London due to a lack of testing. Do you think that's a fair statement? I recognise that we need to increase testing without a doubt. But what I hate is using politics, the play on politics, while we're dealing with real lives and real people. Um, I, I, I've said this directly to Sadiq before, that you are the London mayor. Don't blame a Conservative government for your feelings, to, for failing to address some of the core issues within London. You have a lot of authority. You have a lot at your disposal. Exercise what you have to give Londoners a better experience here at this point in time. Um, and, and we heard Boris say they're going to increase testing. We expect that to happen. I'm neither Conservative nor Labour. But what I do believe is we need to start building bridges and get, get across that whole partisan politics into caring for the people of our community. Nimza Bunge, always a pleasure to have you on Channel's Business Global. Thank you very much. Coming up on Channel's Business Global, I'll be discussing the pitfalls and opportunities for Africa's evolving digital payments ecosystem with the CEO of DMA Global, Leon Isaac. See you after the break.
Welcome back to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. In a moment, I'll be speaking with Leon Isaacs from DMA Global. But before then, here's some company news for you. Microsoft has confirmed plans to acquire ZeniMax Media, the parent company of game developers and publishers Bethesda Softworks, for $7.5 billion in cash. Bethesda is the studio behind several critically acclaimed and best-selling gaming franchises, including The Elder Scrolls and Fallout. The acquisition will bring Bethesda's impressive portfolio of games, technology and talent to Xbox. Tiffany & Co has won the very first round in its billion-dollar battle with LVMH. The judge has agreed to fast-track the case, setting a January the 5th, 2021 date for the luxury good purveyors four-day trial. In November, LVMH and Tiffany announced that the conglomerate would acquire the jeweler for $16.2 billion, originally billed as the largest ever transaction in luxury goods. The deal fell apart in recent weeks after LVMH claimed that the French government asked it to delay the purchase following a trade dispute with America. Tiffany responded by suing, claiming that LVMH was trying to use the coronavirus pandemic to lower the price of the acquisition. The owner of the hotel chain, Premier Inn, has announced plans to cut up to 6,000 jobs as the coronavirus outbreak continues to ravage the hospitality industry. Whitbread said the figure represents 18% of its total workforce. The FTSE 100 listed firm said the cuts were a regrettable but necessary step to ensure that we emerge from the crisis with a lower cost base, a more flexible operating model and a stronger, more resilient business. Total sales for the group in the UK and abroad plunged almost 77% in the 26 weeks to the end of August. Now over to our next topic. COVID-19 has exposed Africa's digital divide. Next to poor infrastructure, limited access to digital payment systems is considered one of the most binding constraints for e-commerce in the developing world. Cash is used in almost 90% of retail transactions in Africa, forcing digital businesses like Uber to resort to its use. For more on this, I'm now being joined by Leon Isaacs, the CEO of DMA Global, a development consultancy specialising in improving environments for payment systems, remittances and diaspora investments. Leon Isaacs, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. According to some recent data, online spending is expected to reach $4.5 billion in Nigeria. If you compare it to where I am here in the UK, it's $885 billion per year. Uh, clearly, there's a massive gap. Where are the obvious hurdles in Nigeria and across Africa? Uh, well, thank you, Juliana. Um, I think the first point says you've got to start somewhere. So Nigeria started a long way behind the UK in this whole process. I think you really have to start with how many people actually are familiar with financial products, how many, actu how many people actually access products that aren't cash related. And the numbers for Nigeria, you're talking at around about 30% of people that actually access products through an account or digitally. So you're starting off from a much lower base there. Uh, secondly, the infrastructure is just not there. To get these systems where you can do real-time payments to buy goods and services is extremely complex, takes a long time to build, you need the right regulatory environments, and so on. And I think if you look at the availability of the products and services, we're only just seeing those begin, really. Uh, in Nigeria and uh, a lot of other parts of Africa. So there's a, we're just starting at the beginning in um, Nigeria, and I suspect if they can learn lessons from other countries, it won't take as long to actually get to the right position for them. I think we sometimes forget that the number for the UK is impressive, but the country as a whole has been working on it for 50 years, one way or another. Mm. In Nigeria, we're talking about probably a matter of five years or so. So, you know, sometimes I think we give African nations a hard time when they haven't had some of the luxuries that the UK have had in terms of time, attention, money and resources to achieve these, these things. 
Yeah, perhaps perhaps uh, more patience is needed. There was a report last week, uh, Leon, uh, talking about the informal sector as the Africa uh, Risk Report. And they said that uh, even though 70 percent of um, the economy is um, the um, uh, informal sector in sub-Saharan Africa, during COVID, they have seen a formalization of this sector. Because, of course, if you can't go out and earn your wage, you need these palliatives, you need these government handouts, and therefore a data is starting starting uh, to grow from these sectors. Do you think this is a flash in the pan or do you think governments, policymakers will be able to uh, work on this to enhance uh, the data, to start uh, pushing, um, you know, market traders onto digital platforms? Well, I think it is a massive opportunity. And in a way, it's one of the good things to have come out of COVID because COVID's really given an acceleration to things that people have been talking about and known for a long time um, in that digital is efficient, it's cheaper, uh, and generally it's better for people. But so, and what's really COVID has done is because people haven't had any other choice, they've tested it and they've used it. And getting people to trust digital payments or anything that's out of the norm is actually quite a difficult task, particularly in the environment where there's generally a lot of fraud and mistrust. So. This, what's happened is people have tried, seen it works, and will continue to do it. And I think going forward, it's really important that we don't sort of take the foot off the pedal and actually find means of encouraging and incentivizing people. Uh, you know, it's well, sorry, it's well known in, for uh, developing countries that actually getting the government to make its own payments to its citizens digitally um, is actually one of the first ways you go about trying to encourage greater use. And so I think it's really important for those countries that aren't doing that at the moment at a government level to really start doing that. And the more you do that, the more people will, will take it up for sure. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And you mentioned the government a lot there. Uh, do, you, do you think African citizens need to stop, uh, you know, relying on the government? And perhaps, you know, we need more of a push from the public sector uh, when it comes to, you know, evolving and improving the digital payment um, ecosystem. Do, do you think that's where the objective uh, should be? Well, I think it needs to be a real partnership. I know it's very corny, but it does need to be a partnership between the government and the private sector. I think what we need is the private sector to bring the products, the know-how and the technical solutions. And we need government to basically provide the right regulatory environment and in cases, infrastructure. Um, so I'm talking here about, you know, phone masts in rural areas and so on to actually make things happen. But generally speaking, it's a partnership. Private sector delivers the product. The government, in effect, does no harm. It makes sure the private sector can operate in a safe and fair way for all users, but not in a way that's so restricted that it's either impossible or very expensive to introduce products. That's really the role for government here. We're running out of time, uh, Leon. I want to talk a little bit about DMA Global. You're the CEO of that firm. What are some of the, the, the projects that you're working on in Africa or are you, are you consulting uh, with firms in Africa? Because digital payments is really kind of a buzz term on the continent at the moment. I've had several of these conversations over the past couple of weeks. Yes, I mean, it, it's great, actually, because we've been advocating digital, I'd say, for eight to 10 years now. And finally, we're seeing traction. Uh, and a lot of our work is partially working with governments, actually, to make sure that they're creating the right environment to allow people to pay and receive money digitally, particularly from outside the continent. Um, but we're also working with a lot of companies that want to operate in Africa, don't know enough about it. Um, but have good service solutions there. So actually for us, digital is completely changing the way we look at things. It's like a step change has been made, um, which is really encouraging. So for us, it's, it's really exciting. It's like the culmination of too many years work all coming together at the same time, which is absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. The pandemic has done so much in so many different ways, right? Good and bad. Leon Isaacs, CEO of DMA Global Limited. Thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. Sadly, that's all we have time for today, but do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.